Welcome to the Hunt Pack Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. In this episode, we are taking a break from our Building a Backcountry Rifle series to do another Q&A episode. So Steve and myself are going to answer your questions. The questions are all over the place today. In a very good way, we cover some great ground. Listeners, as always, you can submit your questions to us by emailing us to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Without further ado, let's get into it and tackle your questions. Steve, how's it going, man? Really good, man. It's uh, bear season's kicked off here. Can't wait to get out and do some hunting. And yeah, I'm just excited. Spring is in the air. <laughs> yeah, that's for dang sure. Yeah, we're here just post Easter recording this one. Uh, you know, we've been deep in the building a backcountry rifle series with the podcast for a bit now. I wanted to hit pause on that. We'll have more episodes in the future, but kind of mix things up. And we did. Uh, I guess like a two-part back-to-back Q&A, uh, shoot, I guess a couple months ago now, but the questions have been piling up from you guys, and we didn't want to sit on those too long, so we wanted to get to your questions, which is what we're here to do in this episode. Um, but before that, just building a backcountry rifle series, it's gone, I think, really well. We've had a ton of great feedback heard from a lot of you guys, so not only I know was it fun... <laughs> For us, Steve and I, to have all these conversations and do these interviews and just learn a ton ourselves, but it sounds like it's been received uh, equally as well. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely gotten tons of emails and, and guys just coming to the shop, and it seems uh, seems everyone's really enjoyed it. I know for me personally, it's been, you know, rifles was uh, a foreign concept, frankly. I mean, I know the basics, but getting into all the nitty-gritty stuff, um, it was really fun, and it's been fun getting this um, getting this rifle sighted in and going through that process and just now getting to the point where, um, get my groups dialed in and figuring out which, uh, you know, exact bullet I want to shoot. And it's been a lot, a lot of fun. Hopefully I'll be able to get a bear killed with the gun this spring and, and kind of put it to the test. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, just listeners will have more of those probably interspersed, uh, you know, through the coming months as we do preseason. Um, but they won't be back to back like they have been for this good chunk. Um, and then speaking of, just want to remind all of you guys, we have the giveaway going on with Ryan Kleckner in his uh, long range shooting handbook. We have 10 copies of that to give away. And, you know, with podcasts, it's interesting because when, when we release a show, we get a good amount of traffic, like, you know, within the first week, within the first two weeks of that episode. But so many people find the podcast and they're going back through older episodes. And so with this giveaway, we kind of wanted to stretch it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to let it uh, run up until the end of May. So if you guys are hearing this anytime in April or May, head to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book. And there you can enter the giveaway. It's incredibly easy. That said, for you guys who have already hopped on that, there's over 600 entries, which is awesome. We wanted to give away half of those books. So literally just now, I pulled up the little uh, giveaway program that we use, and they allow you to just literally click a button, and it chooses a random winner, and you can keep doing that. So I chose five of you guys right now. So Eric Collip, Nick Reith, Brad Morrow, Jonathan Shoby, and Matt Suchik, I think. The five of you guys just won a copy of Ryan's book, The Long Range Shooting Handbook. So thank you guys so much for entering that giveaway. And again, there's five more. So if you guys aren't into the giveaway, giving away five more books, head to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book for that. Uh, Steve, what's up? Before we get into the Q&A, what's going on with Exo? Um, it's been, I know, crazy since the launch kind of of the 2017 updates. But any, any timely updates we should uh, make people informed of right now? Uh, you know, right now we just got a pretty hefty backlog that we're kind of fighting through. Um, one, just, just, you know, we're just growing. We're still a small company and, and growth this year has been kind of more than we anticipated. So it's kind of 
you're always juggling that, trying to build enough that you think you're going to sell and not overbuild and, and uh, orders just keep piling in, which is a great thing. But yeah, it's caused us to be about four weeks behind right now. So anybody order a pack today would you know roughly see tracking uh, information emailed to them in about four weeks. Yeah. Um, other than that, yeah, we're plugging away. The dry bag development's coming along really well. It's just about polished up and go to production with that. We're hoping to have that ship in in June. And um, man, right before we know it, it's going to be uh, – august 15th and be out there hunting yeah absolutely it's been it's been so fun just even the last couple weeks with bear season getting ready to kick off turkey seasons kicking off and shed hunting in full swing to see all the exo customers kind of sharing their their time in the field so if you guys aren't aware we kind of do a hashtag thing and we have the hashtag exo in the wild and it is so fun to see what everybody's been up to you guys have been hitting the hills hard for sure and just can't wait to see how that continues through bear season and scouting season. And as you said, gosh, soon on into hunting seasons for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, we also want to, last thing before we dive into the Q&A, welcome Hoyt aboard as a sponsor of the podcast. Um, if you guys have been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that Steve and I both uh, kind of began shooting Hoyt last year. Um thoroughly enjoyed shooting the carbon defiant last year the 2017 hoyt bows showed up on the doorstep today didn't they steve uh yep yeah they're here i already i unboxed mine and got the rest on and side on and uh tied a loop on real quick start running some arrows through it nice nice so what, what was your kind of looking back at you know shooting hoyt uh not for the first time ever, but the first time in a while last year and getting some field time with that, what sticks in your mind about that Hoyt and the experience with the carbon defiant? Um, yeah, you know, it's just a, it's a really well balanced bow. Uh, obviously it's not the fastest bow out there. Um, you know, it, it's just a well balanced bow. I don't know how else to put that. Um, you know, from top to bottom, just the draw cycle, you know, it's very important to me not to have a very, harsh cycle you know mainly because my shoulders typically messed up um so i shoot low poundage i want to be able to draw in awkward situations and having a really smooth draw cycle makes a big difference for that so speed's definitely not something i'm too concerned about um and then i do love you know uh the, the super light carbon riser yeah. you know just from a packing it around the backcountry perspective you know i packed around uh, elites which are you know great bows um but I shot those for a better part of a decade and just dropping that half pound roughly uh, every time I pick the bow up, uh, bow up off the ground, I notice it and definitely really like that. Um, I did uh, took me a little bit of uh, tweaking to get it paper tuned perfectly. Um, just I was struggling at first with some broadhead tuning on it, and then went to the paper tuning to get it kind of figured out. But once I had that thing dialed in last year, it was uh, man, it was um, I hadn't shot a bow that well in a long time. I'll put it that way, and that. If I did make a bad shot, you knew where it hit, right? Like right. If, it was if predictable. the trigger broke off a little soon and you knew it was high and left, you know, pull up the binos or range finder or whatever I got if it's a 50, 60 yard shot. And yep, sure enough, the arrow's high and left. Um, so once I had that thing dialed in, I was really, really happy with it. So yeah, definitely just a great all around bow. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have more to say about that in the future, but just wanted to uh, to welcome Hoyt aboard. We're excited to be shooting them again um, for 2017. Can't wait to, uh, you know, see what arrows we get to send down range with those Carbon Defiance again, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so the first question we're going to take is from Dylan, and he purchased an XO 3500 recently, although, you know, what he's getting at applies to all kinds of packs, not just our XO packs, but... He says, I was wondering what's the best way you guys have found for loading your packs up with weight without necessarily packing up all of your backpacking gear every time. So for doing training hikes and things like that, he says, is it fine to throw a couple dumbbells in the bottom of the pack? Would sandbags or something else be better? And then what is the best way to load training weight and have you and have it distributed effectively? So I know personally I use sandbags uh, most often um even occasionally we'll throw some weight plates in there not dumbbells um but what do you use steve i know that uh sandbags have often been toted by you does anything else work better that you found uh not really yeah sandbag and i prefer kind of um one that's not packed really really tight you know so the sand's kind of loose in there Mm -hmm. and that way you know it's acting more like meat um i did 
Um, I've actually done a few of them now, hikes with uh, our new dry bag insert that I filled completely full of water. And Just, that um, that's an ass kicker. <laughs> what, what, what will that hold yeah. about? Um, man, I, I filled up the 2000 bag and I think it was like, uh, I know it was 60 something pounds if okay. I remember right. This was a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting cause it was a very dynamic weight, right? I mean, it, it's strapped to the pack really nice. Um, but it was definitely every step, you know, there was just that little bit of jostle of the water, uh-huh. um, you know, left and right up and down. And so I think you're kind of working more of those stabilizer muscles than you would definitely more than a sandbag. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, the second I started hiking with it the first time, it like instantly kind of brought me back. Like one of those little flashback memories in your head, you know, like when you smell something you have a memory pop in your head and it was <laughs> of just having meat on my that back. Feeling, you know, right? just, yeah. Just that feeling just kind of like, Oh man, this feels like I've got a whole bunch of boned out meat on my back. So water was pretty sweet for sure. But if you don't have access to that, um, uh, sandbags, I think is your next, next best bet. I would avoid dropping, you know, an 80 pound dumbbell on the bottom of the pack. Um, not that the pack can't handle it, but that's just not going to be, it's just going to carry so much differently than, uh, a, you know, a pack wood that's got the weight distributed all the way through it. Um, so yeah, that'd be my suggestion. Just run to, you know, Home Depot, any kind of hardware store. And most of them have sandbags for sale, especially during the winter. Uh, might be kind of hard to find right now, but, yeah. um, I've done a few where I just, uh, found like a big rock and threw it in the pack and kind of just strapped it up high and that kind of worked, but that's been a oddball here and there when, uh, I didn't have a sandbag with me for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Sandbags work really well. I've also done, um, the bags of quick Crete, which obviously those are a bit more solid yeah. and hard. You don't get kind of that meat squishy effect with loose sand that you would. But the nice thing with those is if you go to Home Depot or whatever, you can often find like a 50, a 60 and 80 pound bag of quick Crete. So if you want to train with different weights, um, you can easily, you know, spend the four or five bucks per bag and get a few different, um, weights. And that way you can go from, you know, 60 to 80 pounds or what have you with those, as well as depending on the type of sandbag you use. Oftentimes I'll wrap those in duct tape or something just cause they leak and it can be a pain. Um, but yeah, sand, quick yeah. Crete, uh, yeah, the water, the water's interesting. I know some guys do water, although not in the dry bag, although they'll probably get to that when they can, but simply for the fact that a lot of guys want to go uphill with weight, but they don't want to come downhill with weight just to save their knees. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know some guys carry jugs of water or whatever means they have to go uphill and they'll literally just dump the water and then come down lighter just to save that downward stress on their knees. Um, but yeah, dumbbells can work. I've done dumbbells, um, with the exo pack, I will be, I would be putting those, you know, in between the bag and the frame, kind of using the load shelf, using those compression straps so that they're not just sagging down completely. Um, but any, you know, weight is weight in some sense. And is, is a, we always recommend with any load and, you know, with any pack again, just kind of keep it high and tight if you can and keep it from, you know, being too loose and too low. Cause that's just, that's just physics. And that's, you know, it's just going to put way more stress on your body regardless of what pack you're using. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have a question from Kyle who has uh, a baby on the way or obviously his, wife or girlfriend or significant other does he doesn't and he also has a very demanding job so he's looking forward to future seasons and he thinks it's going to be a struggle to get out for you know anything more than three days maybe not even that so he's wondering what are some tips for finding success when only being able to go out here and there and not being able to have extended hunts so you know i know as much as we talk about backcountry, as much as we talk about backpack style hunting, it's difficult for most guys to set aside, you know, five days or a week or 10 days to go on, you know, one big hunt. And there's, there's a ton of weekend warriors. Uh, there's a ton of long weekends. There's a ton of two or three day trips here and there. So for those shorter trips, Steve, what are the specifics that the every guy, everyday guys, um, can use to make that hunting time more efficient? Um, man, I would say, you know, this goes uh, opposite of having time, but we we do it a lot. We do like these 24 hour scouting trips. You know, we pick an area on Google earth, we do our research 
and then we you know bomb out early on a Friday or something like that, hike in there, scout, come back out at noon the next day. Um, and so that would be my first bit of advice is I would not, you know, know where you're going to hunt, um, as best as you can. I mean, obviously it may, I don't know if he's traveling out of state or something like that, then that would really be hard. But if, if it's something where he can do a two, three hour drive and, and get out and get in the country and learn it, um, you know, you're going to just speed up the process of the hunt that much more. Cause you're going to know where you need to be. Um, I would just like when we do those short trips, man, we just hike, uh, we, get in there we hike 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 we you know camp uh, we kind of predetermine a glassing point that we'd want to get to for be there for the evening and then hopefully find it where you know in the morning we can wake up and, and like a short little hike to the other side of the ridge or whatever um to glass a different spot and then we hike back out and just really you know it's those the evening and glassing se- uh, sessions are about finding the animals but the the rest of the hiking and just getting in the country is just learning it because that Again, that's just going to help you uh, infinitely when it comes to actually coming time to hunt. Um, outside of that, be prepared. <laughs> One thing that I've learned um, is I like definitely buy in bulk. Like in August, start you know I just buy all the mountain house that I think I'm going to need. I jump on uh, Amazon or whatever and order up you know all the type the bars and stuff that I want. Um, so that way, if if I do you know, last minute decide to do a hunt or whatever. I'm, I've, I've got the stuff. I'm not running around town trying to get my tags and get my food and get this and that organized. Um, and I always keep my hunting gear pretty well organized. As soon as I get home from a trip, it gets washed, cleaned, put away. And that way I'm ready to go, you know, as soon as I decide to. So, um, that'd be a couple tips. I'm sure there's a, a million more, you know, um, trying to think, pick, pick areas that maybe, are kind of off the beaten path you know it's a strategy we like to use a lot anyways of you know maybe you don't go to the trailhead that has a five mile hike in maybe you park literally on the side of a highway and, and climb up a couple thousand feet and get into really good hunting that everybody bypasses and you can save yourself a bunch of, of hiking time doing that yeah that's great i think the biggest thing and i mean you said it is to have a plan i mean if you only have two to three days don't go in there with like a rough idea of, yeah, I think this general kind of vicinity looks okay. As you mentioned, I would have like specific glassing points or specific areas you want to check out and even how you tie those areas together as you're covering ground, just to try to be as efficient as possible to waste as little time as possible. Think through the logistics, you know, if it matters, depend on what type of country your time of year, such as water. I mean, you know, Wasting two hours to make a trip to get water on a two-day trip is a bummer. Um, yeah. If you can plan around that, have all of that stuff prepared, have a plan, know what you're going in for, know what you're going to do. Sure, plans change, of course, but unless you have that, I think you know a lot of it can just be walking around um, and just not being efficient. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely something. Like I'm just as you were saying, I was recalling my deer hunt last year. Where, why well, I ended up picking going into a, an area completely blind. Um, and I, I mean, I had studied the crap out of Google earth and maps knew where every spring was, uh, knew, Oh, I want to be here at this time glassing. And then if that doesn't work out, I'm going to hike out. I'm going to get to this spot and start glassing. Um, and if, if I wake up opening morning and there's nothing here, I'm going to hike along the ridge cause there's water over there. Yeah. Then I'll glass from that point. I mean, definitely like had it all planned out so that, that it, uh, you know, just kind of flowed once you get there. Right. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes less about how much time you have more than it is. How do you use the time that you do have and managing that? Well, oh, for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It's funny, Steve, when you mentioned bulking on mountain house, it, this is totally not on topic in terms of our agenda for tonight, but it made me think, um, the dehydrator discussions that we've had in episodes previous, <laughs> uh, I've been freaking loving it because I, I said on a previous episode, I think it might have been with Lampers when I was like, all right, that's it. I got to do the dehydrator thing. I got to try this. Yeah. So for the past couple of months, I think I picked one up somewhere around the new year. But for the past couple of months, I've been playing with recipes. And the cool thing is, you know, I've realized that so much of what we were doing already in terms of just regular dinners and that could be great backpacking meals. And hmm. so I've been more like, all right, here's you know, two meals worth of leftovers. Let's try and dehydrate this and see how it goes. 
So it's been really cool. There's been a couple things where I've been intentional about like making a recipe for something or trying it. Um, but there's been other stuff where, you know, like our favorite, uh, elk chili, you know, that we make all Mm -hmm. the time just for dinners. Like that's a no brainer to do that stuff. Um, we did like a, we did a huge, like, uh, pork uh shoulder i think it was and did pulled pork and i dehydrated that and have already tested rehydrating and doing that with like a simple rice um it's been awesome so it's been cool uh to do that and not only um not have to rely on mountain house but realize how much of what we were already cooking could be dehydrated and it's it's one of those things where i think you know ryan and other guys have said it on the show but where it sounds like I don't know. I was, I was thinking there's like some secret magic thing to dehydrating food, you know, like at this temperature for a certain amount of time and whatever, but it's more so there's a, there's a certain temperature range, but it's pretty general and you literally just dehydrate this stuff till it's dry. Like you can Hmm. ballpark it and you can check it at, you know, eight hours or nine hours or 10 hours or whatever, but you just kind of get to that point where like, yeah, that stuff's dry. And it packs up super small and is so far rehydrated really well. So hmm. just wanted to throw uh, and, that out there for you guys who are on in the your fence research. About that. Have you, um, do they indicate like an expiration date on that? I mean, obviously it probably depends on how you package it, how well it's sealed up. Yeah, exactly. So it depends on how well it's sealed. Um, you know, I've been vacuum sealing everything, which some people say is even overkill unless you do want it to have a really long storage life. I mean, some guys are you know, dehydrating the stuff and just straight into a regular Ziploc, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. I would feel pretty comfortable doing that shorter term, but, you know, some of these recipes where I'm packing stuff in February and not going to use it till September, I definitely feel better with that long of a stretch with it being vacuum packed. Mm-hmm. Um, some people do throw it in the freezer and just let it naturally, uh, you know, they'll literally pull it out of the freezer as they leave to go on a trip. Um, and I guess with, especially if that's vacuum sealed, Um, since it's airtight, no, um, condensation will build within the package, even though some might outside of the package, if it goes through like a very quick, uh, thaw cycle, but none of that condensation is going to be touching the interior contents of the package if it's vacuum packed. So that's certainly a way to extend shelf life as well. Um, but (laughs) yeah, and all my research, you know, there's different things where you get nitty gritty, um, the higher fat content something has, the more likelihood there could be from spoilage um, just because fat can get rancid a bit more than, you know, gleaner meats and things like that. Um, Been doing a ton of wild games. So really the fat content there is really low. Uh, But yeah, it's been, it's been kind of a fun process. I'm excited to see how it goes uh, in the back country. And I have some trips, you know, before hunting season to test things out, but it's been cool. Awesome. All right. So an interesting question, um, although not a unique one, something we've gotten a fair amount is from Waylon and he is 17 from the Midwest. And as he says, and I quote, I have no friends that are dumb enough to go on a hunt out West with me. (laughs) (laughs) So he's asking what he can do. Uh, should he wait and go by himself? Um, that's kind of one part of his question. Then the second part of his question, he had to do with being young and being on a budget and money saving tips, things like that. But first of all, I guess, you know, there's, there's kind of a few things going, uh, with that one is, uh, being 17. Uh, you know, I'd imagine that that has all kinds of, uh, additional complications apart from just solo hunting. If you're from the Midwest and you, want to go out west in general, um, regardless of an age factor, it's certainly doable, I think. Um, That said, you have to be very strategic. And I would, um, I don't want to say discourage, but I would be very cautious about um, the type of trip that you're trying to undertake and biting off more than you can chew. Um, Being solo, being from you know, the Midwest or out East or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, coming out West and hunting the mountains is all dreamy and sounds great, but you know, it's a lot of work. A lot of things can go wrong, especially if you don't have experience under your belt and especially if you're solo. So my advice here is always do what you can, um, 
to, yeah, man, I mean, maybe, maybe when you're 18, 19, uh, maybe it's 17, I don't know, you can take a trip. I wouldn't, you know, advise like packing for a week and going five miles from the nearest road, anything crazy like that. But get out west, uh, get out during hunting season, you know, do some maybe day hunts. But again, there's all kinds of issues with being solo and just being smart about, you know, knowing where you're going, somebody else knowing where you're going, having some sort of means of communication, ideally, things like that. Um, any thoughts there, Steve? I mean, no, it's not something that you've had to tackle a bunch in terms of out of state, but I mean, you you guys started yeah. hitting, you know, the back country when you were younger and are, are getting out there for sure. Yeah. Um, the first thing, and I think someone, I don't know if it was this, I don't know if it was someone I talked to over the phone or is on this podcast that gave the advice of your, for your first backpacking trip, literally like, even if you're in the Midwest, just go find a tiny little piece of public land, hike in there a mile and stay the night by yourself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and get that out of your system because that that alone is uh if you've never done it is um a pretty interesting experience uh you're definitely gonna not sleep at all i imagine (laughs) uh you're gonna learn a few things you know i would definitely start there and i would probably you know i would do as much backpacking around home as possible so that when you do come out west you're not adding being an inexperienced backpacker into the list on top of everything else that you're going to be going through yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just from a logistics standpoint, you're looking at a lot there of getting the tags, where you're going, communicating. Um, I would definitely start small and then grow from there, you know, um, just like our, uh, you know, our, the, our Alaska trip for us, you know, going up to Alaska a couple of years from moose was kind of like a, you know, it was a, that was a big adventure, you know, maybe not quite the equivalent of being 17 and going out West, but it was a whole new thing. And uh, we're kind of wishing we had done something smaller like the caribou hunt we're doing this year where it's a little bit less money and you're going to learn from it. And then, you know, time goes by, you'll learn and get better at it. Um, Just, you know, there's just a lot of logistics and things going on and how you hunt and all that. So, yeah, absolutely. uh, Hopefully you can find a hunting partner or or even maybe someone doesn't want to hunt, but just come along and do the experience with you. So, yeah. um, And I wouldn't overlook, you know even just taking a trip out west to do some backpacking and not hunting. I mean, if hunting's the goal, that's great. But as you said, building up to things, even the first trip doesn't have to be a hunting trip. Um, And actually, Wayland's from Missouri, where I'm from. There's, I mean, if you want to get down, go to uh, the Mark Twain National Forest um, and and some of the southern sections of the Mark Twain. Big tracts of land. I mean, I've backpack hunted actually for Turkey, uh, which is going on right now in Missouri. I've done backpack hunts for Turkey in the Mark Twain, not seen a soul in two, three days, went through the whole kind of, uh, you know, especially early on anxiety of doing a solo backpack hunt type deal. It was absolutely uh, invaluable that I did those types of things before I ever went out west for sure. So, yeah, start small. Don't, I mean, you know, the end goal is the end goal. The end goal isn't maybe possible tomorrow, but you can get there and start small and, and work on it, work towards it. Yeah. So Waylon also asked about some things on a budget, which tied into a question that, um, that we got literally like 20 minutes before we hit record here. It came through via email and I thought it would be great to address So Grant asked, I hear you guys talking a lot about buying used gear, but I have no idea where to even begin to look for used mountain or backpacking gear. And I have no idea what brands are good or bad or really what to look for. So any tips for someone who wants to hunt the backcountry on a budget? So, I mean, we've talked uh, in multiple episodes, Steve, about the things that you kind of should and shouldn't skimp out on, um, yeah. you know, backpack and boots for sure, are kind of the top two. Um, and then we've talked about, you know, clothing and, and even all of your clothing doesn't have to be hunting specific. There's great, you know, outdoor gear, mountaineering type gear that isn't hunting specific that you can get away with for hunting for sure. Sometimes it's easier to find deals on that stuff. Um, you know, things like shelter for example you might be able to get away with end of the year discounts with used gear 
Specifically on the used angle, Steve, anything come come to mind on where to start in terms of finding used gear? Maybe any tips for shopping for used gear? Um, yeah, I guess, I assume you guys have REIs over there. Yeah, in, I don't know where. Midwest? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. um, a Wayland's from Missouri. Grant, I'm not sure where he's okay. from, but yeah, we have REI. Um, and they're, I know yeah, there's some. They, they always, yeah, they have their gear sale in the, I think it's usually in the spring where people, all the returns, um, that they get, they'll, they'll throw out there and sell for really cheap. That'd be a good one to look at. Um, you know, forums wise, I'm not, frankly, I'm not too up on, um, backpacking forums, but I know like archery talk and rock slide, as far as picking up some hunting specific gear, some clothing, stuff like that. Um, those are great. The, the classified ads on those two forums are just huge. It's kind of an endless supply of, of stuff that you can buy at really good deals. Um, your local Craigslist, again, that probably depends on if you have a whole lot of people locally that are backpacking, this pick, pickings might be slim. Um, Man, yeah, I think uh, there's got to be some places online that you can to buy that used stuff. I just haven't personally researched into it. Yeah, I think for used, uh, forums are definitely the best. Um, in terms of deals, like backcountry.com is a great place, and they actually run a site called Steep and Cheap. Um, it's just steepandcheap.com, and it's kind of a, one of those flash deal sites, kind of like a camo fire is for the hunting space. Um, but with it being backcountry.com, it's kind of more general outdoor gear. Uh, there's some deals can be found on there for sure. Uh, Sierra Trading Post is a place mm. for outdoor gear in general that you can find ridiculously good deals on. Yeah. Anything from clothing to boots to tents and all the above. That's definitely a really good place to start as well. And not only to their prices good, but you search and then, you know, you see a good price on something. And a lot of times you can get another 20 or 30% off with a coupon, uh, with Sierra trading post. So that's a great place as well. But yeah, I like those general outdoor gear sites and outlets, but yeah, when it comes to used gear or hunting specific gear, I think forums are the way to go. As you mentioned, archery talk, uh, rock slide, uh, what's that? 24 hour campfire or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think they do some, some uh, deals on there with their forms and, and used gear. Um, yeah, those are good places to start. And then just hit up, I mean, you know, hit up other friends or other buddies and, you know, maybe they have gear sitting around that you can get rid of. Yeah. Steve, Steve, you'll get a kick out of this, but I think, gosh, six Seven years ago, I bought a rangefinder from you for like seventy-five bucks. I'm still <laughs> yeah. using it. You, you remember uh, that? Is that Nikon one? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, one man's trash is another man's treasure, and I'm using yeah. Steve's trash from like six years ago. <laughs> Boom. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, let's um, see. Yeah, oh. Sierra Trading Post. I'll second that one. I, I actually Dude, crazy. I forgot about there. that, but yeah, I, I bought a lot of stuff. Uh, back when I was getting started from them, whether it was clothing or boots or um, tent, I think I bought from them, sleeping yeah. pad. That's some really good deals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my other favorite kind of shopping tip is uh, with Amazon. Their prices change pretty frequently on products, sometimes for apparently no good reason. But there's this site. Uh, oh, crap. I just forgot. Oh, the one I use is just camel, camel, camel dot com craziest name ever so camel 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 dot com and what you do is you take any amazon product and you throw it into their site you just hit the product give them your email and what they do is they will email you when the price drops and not only that but they show you the historic uh like price history of every product on amazon so for example like uh one of my favorite pairs of shoes that i knew i wanted another pair of but wanted to wait a deal for they were like 110 bucks on Amazon and I went to camel, camel, camel .com, and I put, let me know when they hit like 80 bucks or below and you could name the price. And I sure enough, totally forgot about it. But like two months later, for whatever reason, they dropped like 74 bucks. Boom, picked them up. Two or three days later, they were back up to 110. Again, don't know why they dropped for that short period of time, but it's awesome site if you just kind of want to watch stuff on Amazon and they, you know, Amazon has 
a decent selection of tents and water filters and, you know, other junk too. I certainly encourage everybody to try and support smaller retailers if and when at all possible. Um, you know, but if there's something that others don't have, or even shoot, if we're just talking non hunting gear and you want to get a deal on Amazon, camel, camel, camel.com is pretty cool. All right. Enough shopping. This isn't a ladies podcast. Let's get to the next <laughs> question. Um, okay. So Alan is asking, he said he's listened to pretty much every episode of the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. He's also from the Midwest. He says he has hunted, um, backpack hunted during archery season for six years, but struggles to really find or locate elk. So he, I think he was kind of emailing me and asking about like general hunting areas, um, mm-hmm. You know, but in general, he says he's not looking for a magic spot, but what is maybe he doing wrong if he's not getting into elk too much um, in six years? Uh, That's tough. So he says he's hunting high. Um, I don't know what that means in Colorado. It can be all kinds of things, but, you know, it sounds like he's trying to get up there, get out there for sure, which is good. In six years, and I'm not saying this like in six years you should have it nailed on, but what I'm saying is is in six years you have had enough time to experience uh, good and bad. And what I mean by that is you can be in an area one year that might be super hot, that next year super dead, and vice versa. And I would think that within you know six years you might be able to just say like a couple of those years maybe you did good things but if you were coming from the midwest and only had five or seven or eight days to hunt it's it's not out of the realm of possibility to really struggle to get into elk within five or seven days and if that's all you have to hunt that year cool crap that year kind of sucked right i've been there but um in six years i think you should have the opportunity to experience some good years so i would double down on a few things and one is just I don't know I, so many thoughts come to mind but my first one is thinking outside of the box and let me let me back up and say this I would identify but what do you think has gone wrong so are you running into a lot of hunters are you um, not hearing elk you know if you're during archery season in Colorado I think at some point especially within you know six year period you should be hearing some elk um, okay. Are you not seeing fresh sign? So you're, maybe you're seeing sign, but it's not fresh sign. So like, start to put all these pieces together. Think about what you have encountered, and then think out of the side of the box about what you can do. Um, you know, if you're not hearing elk at all, and I'm not saying like within a five day period, but over the years, if you're hunting in the in the same area or close area, I'd I would honestly probably just give up on that area. Um, if you're not seeing fresh the sign, you need to look at that area from a higher level and think, okay, elk are here at some point, but they're not here now. If they're not here now, where are they? So look at things like, is it a migratory pattern? Is there clear funnels, clear, um, you know, Um, travel corridors do you need to go higher i mean if you're in archery season maybe you uh maybe you're a bit lower so you're seeing sign from later in the season you need to get higher um man i mean it's it's so tough to say alan but i would really look at being super detailed on what have you experienced and what do you think i mean it sounds so common sense What do you think you're doing wrong? Um, And again, probably not all of it's you, but, um, you know, just keep at it. What what comes to mind, Steve, if somebody's struggling to really even encounter elk, um, what are the big things you'd be looking at first? Yeah, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head on the big ones. Um, You know, first, obviously, comes to mind as well. Maybe they're just in an area that there are no elk. And then the next question would be, are you seeing fresh sign? And is it old sign or is there no sign? You know, I mean, obviously, if you're seeing no sign, then then you need to completely pick a new spot. Like you said, if it's old sign, it looks like it was there maybe during the summer and they've moved on. Then, yeah, that would look within five miles of, of 
where you're at now and, and go down the drainage, you know, maybe a little lower in elevation. Um, if he's, you know, you know, maybe it's just an area where maybe there's a low density amount of elk. Uh, he hears a few bugles here and there, sees some fresh sign. Um, but frankly, maybe he's always hunting with the wind at his back and doesn't do a good job keeping his scent down, uh, makes too much noise. You know, there's a lot of things, um, that can just inhibit you from just getting into the elk. You know, we've, we've had days like that where just fresh sign all around us, elk are bugling, but for whatever reason, you know, it's just like, no matter which direction we move, the wind's at your back and man, those elk, their noses aren't going to mess around. You know, they're going to smell you and, and get out of there well before you ever get a chance to see them. So that could be happening. Um, yeah. it's kind of an endless possibility, but I would definitely, um, you know, hopefully over six years he's bounced around and, and tried new places and hasn't like dug his heels deep, you know, sticking into one place. Um, but I would start putting the puzzles, uh, pieces of the puzzle together and, and, um, figure out what's going on. Cause there's, there's something there. Um, and it could just be, he's in a really bad spot and he's hunted the same spot for six years and needs to move on. Um, or he's, um, you know, there, there's a lot of other hunters in the area that prohibit the, you know, the elk don't talk and they move out of there. I mean, it's just kind of an endless combination of things that could be going on. Yeah. Yeah. When, and you know, with Colorado, they, they do really well, um, in terms of breaking down units and making the stats very accessible in terms of hunter numbers and elk numbers and success rates and all the above. Um, you know, I would, I would reevaluate what unit you're selecting. There's plenty of over the counter options. And personally, um, you know, I would be looking for high numbers in terms of just high elk numbers at this point. So even if the hunter numbers were high, um, you know, I think if I were in your shoes and have gone through these years, I would just want to get out there and encounter elk, even if there were quite a bit of other uh, other hunters. Um, I mean, maybe it's almost like I said before, with thinking outside the box. Maybe, you know, you've tried the super secret spot and it just didn't work. Like maybe you've tried to go where the numbers are lower or the number of hunters is lower or you've tried to you know, kind of outsmart everybody, which is the way I think as well. I don't fault you for that, but man, maybe at this point, just reevaluate things and go, all right, where's a bunch of people hunting? Where are people killing elk, any elk, any class of elk, bulls, cows? I don't care where are the elk, let's go find some elk. Um, I would probably yeah. kind of circle back and look at that just to kind of, to, you know, get your feet wet with that for sure. So Steve, you mentioned elk's nose. You're never going to fool them. Gabe asked, what are your thoughts on fire at camp or in the back country? Is the smell of wood smoke a bad thing? This isn't, he didn't say it was just about elk, but you know, elk yeah. deer, whatever it all smell matters. But what are your thoughts specifically on fires and the smell of wood smoke? Um, I think we've mentioned this on a podcast before, but I have absolutely no issue doing it. I think there's probably some really experienced hunters that would say the complete opposite. Uh, I think, having your clothes smell like smoke and not human BO is a way better trade off. So if it's like day three or four of a hunt and you're already really stinking smokes, a better smell to have in your clothes. Um, I've, I've just done it. Uh, I've done it both ways. I've had, had a fire and my clothes reeked of smoke and I woke up and woke up in the morning and got right into elk, um, and never had an issue with it. Right. I mean, it doesn't, you're never gonna fool their nose. Um, and you might, I mean, I think where scent can come into play is maybe they're within 50 yards and the wind swirls for just a second. Um, and I think I'd rather have them smell smoke than BO. So, um, and that might just give you that extra half a second to get a shot off. So I have no issues with it. Again, I'm sure there's some guys out there just shaking their head thinking, no, oh, you're absolutely crazy. So, uh, the one thing we do is if we are going to have a fire, we try to keep it low profile. You know, we're not going to be like, out in a big opening where something could see us from you know a distance off and uh, obviously you know make a fire pit and keep it safe so we're not starting any forest fires out there yeah right along that thought of being low profile drew had a question he says when hiking up an exposed ridge to a glassing point in the dark are you ever worried about mule deer getting spooked from your headlamp would a red light be a better alternative in this situation 
Um, you know, I don't know the exact science on this, but yes, I believe a red light is the better alternative. Um, we go out of our way to hike as much as we can in the dark. Um, I don't have a headlamp that has a red light on it. So if I do have to turn my headlamp on, I try to just keep it low and, and, um, you know, the lowest setting and just point it straight at the ground. I'm not lifting my head up and looking all over the place. Um, but I don't know how you could ever prove, you know, say you're hiking up one side of a ridge and on the other ridge, half a mile away, there's a, a buck sitting there. I mean, it's dark, so I don't know how you'd ever know for sure if you saw that light and just decided he was going to burger on out of there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of common sense to keep a low profile and, and your headlamp falls right in line with that. Yeah, I would think that if you were, you know, within range enough of a buck where the light was truly, you know, invading his space, if you will, or gave him some right. cause of concern, you'd also have a wind and a sound and another issue. I think if you're quite a far away on a ridge and maybe the light's faintly visible, I, don't, I can't imagine a buck spooking from that if you're sort of outside his zone, if you will. Yeah, but, yeah, I would agree with that. But Steve, what the heck? No red light? You're missing <laughs> out, man. Yeah. I'm not talking about just, hunting, just like camp life. The red light is the way to go. Hmm. I have not, not used that one yet. Dude, you're going you're gonna to get on the podcast in a few months, and this is going to be like how you talk now about how, why did I never use trekking poles before? <laughs> the red light is going to be well, revolutionary. Right. Challenge accepted. Try it, man. <laughs> your hunting partners will like you much better. You like yeah. yourself much better. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. Cause you, I mean, especially when it's dark and you have the red light, you can see just fine, but it truly does not mess kind of with your, with your vision. You don't get that washed out and have to readjust type deal. Red light's the way to go. I'll send you a new headlamp, Steve. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is an interesting question. We actually got from a couple guys. Uh, actually, it's been more than a couple, but I have a couple jotted down here. Andrew and Kevin had both asked about any tips or concerns about securing and storing items at their vehicle when they head out for an extended hunt. So, Park the truck at a trailhead. The truck has, you know, coolers in it. Maybe has extra gear in it. Um, maybe, you know, Kevin mentioned specifically a two-man hunt. They bring meat back to the truck, have meat stored in the coolers. You know, they kind of worry about leaving that meat, somebody stealing it or getting into it while they go back to fill a second tag. Um, but just in general, parking at a on the side of the road, parking a trailhead and worrying about securing and storing gear. What are your experiences, thoughts? Do you do anything, Steve, to kind of shore that stuff up as best as you can? What's your approach? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, a, I've never had that happen to me. Uh, B I know of guys it's happened to typically, it seems like they're parked along a major road or something like that. Um, where maybe they're a little bit more susceptible to somebody who would steal something from somebody else driving by and going, Oh, I wonder what's in that truck. Um, you know, I think just common sense principles here of, you know, no different than parking in the mall parking lot. Don't have like valuables sitting out in the front seat to tempt somebody. Um, you know, just hide everything best you can. And then I always kind of just cover up anything in there that I, you know, say I have like a swirl bino case, even though my binos are with me, I'll make sure that if I leave the case in the truck, it's not sitting on the front seat, tempting somebody, um, anything in the bed of the truck. I, you know, I, I guess I try to just get everything inside the truck and locked. Um, I did, uh, when we have coolers, um, you know, that won't fit inside the truck or say they're big coolers filled with ice. I, we usually will pack those like you know three four five hundred yards maybe not quite 500 yards but get them away from the truck and find a nice real shady spot in some trees um that way they're staying cool and they're out of sight you know something easy for somebody to grab out of the back of your truck uh that's about it i don't know what else you can do you know it's definitely um something you think about for sure uh you know i guess for us we typically i mean i don't have too many like trailheads that we park at where there's going to be you know, 10 other rigs there. It's pretty remote stuff. So it's usually not that much of a concern for us, but I could definitely see, you know, I see pictures of a Colorado trailhead and, you know, all these guys going for elk hunt and there's 15 rigs parked there and, 
you know, it's a long ways on a dirt road to used to get there. Um, yeah, I don't know what you do. Um, what have you done in the past, Mark? Yeah, I mean, like you, just the common sense stuff. Um, I think some of the crowd has kind of worked in our favor in a ways um, in terms of, you know, I can think to a couple trailheads that we've parked at that are um, their multi-use areas. So you have guys coming and fly fishing like at a stream that's right there. You have day hikers going up a certain trail that's different than the direction we are hunting. Um, There are outfitters who are operating out of that area, and so they kind of have a horse corral set up, and they're taking clients in and out. And I think it it almost works in our favor in that way because it's not someplace that's super remote. But even at the trailhead, there's guys coming and going and hustle and bustle, and so there's a lot more activity, and I think that keeps, um, you know, Mm -hmm ill people away from doing harm just because there's more eyes and more activity going on. Um, so I think from our experience, that's actually kind of helped and kept things in our favor, but yeah, I mean, storing coolers and things kind of away from the rig out of sight is a good idea. Andrew asked specifically about that. I think it can be a good idea. Um, aside from that, yeah, just lock up as much as you can, uh, disguise as much as you can. You know, there's been times where, you know, we've had coolers locked up or traveling out of state. I've had a backup bow in the truck and I'm not going to advertise a bow case, you know, in there, things like that, that, you know, kind of common sense out of sight, out of mind and, yeah. and do what you can for sure with that. But unfortunately is one of those things that, um, man, Beyond, beyond that stuff, unfortunately, things can happen. And unfortunately, the guys, things have happened. But yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's a pretty, pretty rare instance. I mean, maybe there's certain areas right. where there's more crime than others. But for the most part, it's something you shouldn't have to worry about. Yeah. You know, the, the only people that should be there are outdoors people and other hunters that if you're at a backpack and trailhead should be like minded like you and aren't going to break into somebody's truck. Yeah, for sure. So we had a message from Kurt, and he was wondering how to prevent and treat tick bites. Uh, he said, you know, he's been in the backcountry hunting. He hasn't had any issues um, with ticks actually, uh, you know, getting in them and biting them and uh, being in the skin, but he's found several on them before they've done so. But he's, you know, read about Stephen Ronella's bout with Lyme disease and things like that, and so he has some cause for concern with ticks. Um, and I was asking for tips. Um, you know, the, the one thing I do, um, kind of during tick season, if you will, is often pre-treat my clothes, um, and my socks, especially with, uh, permethrin, which is a spray on treatment, uh, again, not on the skin, but on your clothing, um, and it dries without a scent. It doesn't, uh, you know, really affect the clothing in any harmful ways. I think there are a few sort of synthetics, either plastics or rubbers. I don't recall that permethrin can interact with, but kind of your standard um, synthetic apparel, merino wool, etc., that you'll be wearing. No issues really with using permethrin on that. Um, and it's really good stuff. It lasts through multiple washes. So it's kind of, for me, it's usually a once a year treatment most often that I'll do permethrin. Um, and that's about the only preventative I take. Any, any other thoughts for you, Steve? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, during spring bear season, uh, we do treat our clothes with permethrin. I'm always worried about I mean, even though it dries scent free, it's kind of smelly stuff before that. And so I'm always a little worried about it um affecting the hunt i'm pretty i despise ticks with every ounce of my being and uh <laughs> and I'm, I'm constantly looking for them so i think that's the number one uh thing that i do is just if i feel like i'm in an area i guess i'm just distracted by it but i'm always you know looking at my pants and lifting up my leg and looking at my socks and um just try to get get them off me before they you know dig in so he makes uh, uh, like Jason and yeah. Tyler and Lenny draw straws on who has to check them for ticks each night. Actually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my turn yeah. again. This sucks. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, maybe avoid like uh, super brushy stuff that you got to walk through or something like that, and take the take the route around. 
Um, seems like whenever I'm bear hunting, I got to go just bust through a bunch of brush. So you come out of that on the other end and you have four or five on you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's tough though. I mean, they're, um, I hate those little buggers. Fortunately for us, I, you know, in all my years hunting Idaho in September, I don't think I've ever had a tick on me. I mean, it's, I know they're still out and about, um, but for whatever reason, you know, I think they're very, you know, a lot less active in September, um, cause I just don't see them and, and, you know, it's only an issue in, in the spring bear seasons and, and a little bit in early backpacking. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I never really see them in, you know, in the archery season in late summer, early fall, but spring even here they're super bad for sure yeah all right let's wrap up with this one zach asked about uh why someone should choose paper maps over a gps and vice versa kind of what are the pros and cons and then he also asked what are the good sources for paper maps Uh, i hesitate to punt this question to you steve because you pretty much are a jedi and don't use either in the field right (laughs) <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my take on this, uh, I do use paper maps and GPS, and I intentionally often have both, um, you know, especially for trips out west, especially if I'm headed into new country. You know, I love a GPS, um, and I guess my definition of GPS has changed over the years. I used to be kind of like the diehard, have a Garmin dedicated GPS unit guy. I didn't really trust um, phones and using a phone as a GPS, but over the last couple of years, I've gone to only using my phone. Um, you know, once I've had a chance to test that thoroughly, you know, if you use... Um, an app like Onyx Maps on your phone, you know, it kicks the pants off my GPS in terms of you can easily switch between multiple views, multiple layers, jump from satellite to topo to whatever the heck you want. Um, And the battery life is incredible. If you just put your phone in airplane mode, the phone's GPS chip is still fully operational. Um, I had no problems getting through a week-long hunt. I did top off my phone with a tiny little portable power pack um but probably could have almost got away with the week without it and obviously that depends on how much you use it but so i do really like a gps or you know a gps app on a phone for being able to switch between multiple layers for being able to zoom in and view fine detail and then most importantly for being able to easily mark points in the field and have um, points before the trip that I've loaded into the GPS. Um, so areas I want to check out, you know, things I'm finding in Google Earth in the preseason in my electronic scouting. So easy to put those into, you know, handheld GPS unit or an app on your phone. When you're out in the field, incredibly easy to mark stuff. And then when you've marked things in the field, you get back from your trip you know, you can put all this data together and the GPS is definitely the way to go in terms of building Intel, um, you know, year over year or from your preseason scouting, things like that. So that said, the reason I carry a paper map, um, you know, is, is partially just as a backup. Batteries fail, electronics fail, devices fall, break, whatever. It's nice to have a map from a, you know, kind of a safety perspective if you're in country that you aren't incredibly familiar with. And then the second reason is just the big bird's eye view. Instead of looking at, you know, a three, four, five inch screen, being able to pull out a map and have a bird's eye view and kind of paint the big picture um, and really see, okay, the elk or the deer might be moving like this. I mean, everything makes much more sense when you can look at it from a big picture perspective. Um, especially when it comes to kind of tie in different sections together and understanding how animals will use, you know, a larger area. So, um, you know, paper maps and GPS do both. Zach asked about good sources for a paper map. Uh, I absolutely love mytopo.com. Um, don't know those guys from Adam, not affiliated with them, but I've been using them for years. They are awesome for a whole bunch of reasons. You can choose the size of the map you want, so the physical size of the paper. You can choose the paper itself, and they have kind of a rugged, waterproof paper that's awesome. 
more importantly, um, you know, standard topo maps, like if you go through the National uh, Geological Survey or whatever, like the, you know, de facto standard of topo mapping agency, they sell a, a topo map in quadrants. And the area that you're hunting in might overlap two or three topo quadrants. So you would have to have, you know, this map for the, you know, say the left half of the area you're hunting, but then this other map for the right half of the area. With my topo, you can kind of merge all these quadrants together and you get to choose exactly what sections you want printed on your map. So I've had maps that have spanned the intersections of three different topo maps, but instead of having three maps, I can have one on my topo because they let you do those types of things. They also let you choose overlays that you want, such as game boundaries. Um, you can uh, import GPS data to their mapping service, so you could literally um, have those printed on your paper map even. So anyway, for a whole bunch of reasons, I've found the mytopo.com uh, service to be incredibly helpful uh, reasonably priced, lightweight, but rugged and fast and good service and all that stuff. So I want to say it's, I don't know, 18 bucks or something. The way that I custom print my maps, the prices vary based on the features you choose, but my Topo's maps are awesome. I'm always going to have them, but, um, I rely on a GPS if I need it much more often. So yeah, about the only that since we got the Delorme in reaches, which now it's Garmin in reach, a um, few years back, and it comes with the EarthMate app and, and run it on the cell phone. It's definitely been, like you said, running the cell phone works awesome. You just put it in airplane mode; it lasts forever. Um, and it is it is nice to zoom in. You can basically have a Google Earth overlay of it, so you can see imagery. You can go to the topo. It's a uh, it's a nice feature to have for sure. Yeah. All right. I think those are all the questions we wanted to tackle tonight. Anything else, Steve, uh, to, to include on this one before we wrap it up? No, I think, I think that's pretty good. Awesome. Well, as always, guys, you can send your questions to us. We will continue to do these episodes. Um, if they can, if the questions continue to come in, so you can contact us directly. Um, just email us podcast at exomontgear.com. Send us your questions and we would love to address them on a future Q and a. Steve, thanks for the time, man. Absolutely. Have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Hunted Backcountry podcast. To access the show notes for this episode and subscribe to future episodes, please visit exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. We value your feedback and would love to hear about any questions, topics, suggestions, or comments you have. Our email address is podcast at exomountaingear.com. If you are enjoying the show, please consider leaving us a review in iTunes. By doing so, you will be entered into our next Exo Mountain Gear swag giveaway. We are looking forward to the next episode and hope you are as well. Catch you next week.